Hi, good evening. My name is Whitney Donhauser, and I'm the Rone Menchel Director and President of the Museum of the City of New York. Thank you so much for joining this evening for the launch of New York Magazine's Encyclopedia of New York, How NYC Changed the World. We are thrilled to partner with New York Magazine for this event. The Encyclopedia of New York is a fun and thorough and gorgeously designed look at many of the unique inventions, ways of thinking, concepts, and idioms that make New York, New York. The book's editor, Christopher Bonanos, will be joining us in just a moment to discuss the book with the actor, comedian, jazz singer, Leah Delaria, who we are honored to have join us this evening. We hope that you'll consider purchasing the book from the museum's online shop. You can click in the chat to purchase, and tonight we're offering 15% off at checkout on the title, Through Midnight Eastern Time. So your support of the museum, whether through purchasing the book, visiting in person, or continuing to attend our virtual events is immensely helpful during this incredibly difficult time. There is no question that New York faces an intense struggle right now. And we at the museum are facing the exact same struggle. Despite the fact that our doors are open once again, we know that it will be months before things start to look anywhere near normal again. But we also believe in the resilience of New Yorkers and the resurgence of our great city and are more committed than ever to serving as a beaker, beacon for New York and its 8 million citizens. Your help allows us to achieve that goal. So if you love the programs at the Museum of the City of New York, programs exactly like tonight's program, Encyclopedia of New York, um, then please consider making a donation to support the museum. So you can just click on the chat feed and make your fully tax deductible gift of any size to ensure that we continue to be New York storytellers. As the Museum of the City of New York, it is exciting to welcome a new encyclopedia about our city and fun to think about what it means to try to capture New York in a single book. We are already big fans of the monumental Encyclopedia of New York City, edited by Kenneth T. Jackson with Lisa Keller, both great historians and great friends of the museum. But we are looking forward to hearing tonight how a very different project drawing on the pages of New York Magazine came together and the picture that it paints of our city. So if you're watching this program on Zoom, you can submit your questions to Chris and Leah using the Q&A function, and then they'll turn over to those at the end of the program. Also, if you're watching on Zoom, we have closed captioning that's available. So all you have to do is enable that at the bottom of your screen. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers. So Christopher Bonanos has been the editor and writer of New York Magazine and its digital siblings for 26 years. He's the author of three books, the most recent of which, a biography of the great New York photographer Ouija, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for the best biography of 2018. Chris has also written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Slate, Travel and Leisure, Condé Nast Traveler, Tablet, and so many more magazines and websites. Leah Delaria is a three-time SAG award-winning actor, comedian, and jazz singer, most notably known for her standout role in Netflix hit series, Orange is the New Black. And she was also the first openly gay comic on television in America. Delaria can be seen on television in the upcoming Hulu series, Reprisal, as well as The Code, Shameless, and Broad City. Selected films include Cars 3, Support the Girls, and The First Wives Club. She was also featured vocalist at the 50th anniversary of the Newport Jazz Festival and has performed in some of the most prestigious houses in the world. House of David, Delaria plus Bowie equals jazz was released in summer 2015 to critical acclaim. So thank you all for joining us tonight. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and to Leah, thank you. Hi. Hey, Chris, how you doing? All right, it's great to be here. I'm so happy to be talking to you. I am thrilled to be talking to you. Uh, I cannot tell you how much I love your book. This book, I mean, <laughs> I'm a proud New Yorker. So a book like this, first of all, it's gorgeous. It's edited beautifully. It is a perfect coffee table book. It is amazing. And I wanna to say to everybody, it is the perfect Christmas gift. 
<laughs> order it, send it to friends. I'm going to do that because it's just brilliant. Yeah, I got it. Chris, I got to tell you, how did you even, how does anyone come up with an idea to, to have an encyclopedia of New York? It's, what was it's, that? It's a bizarre assignment to get at the office. Oh, by the way, we're going to go do an encyclopedia. Tell us everything about New York. One book. <laughs> and I'll tell you the very long story is that some years back, we did a special issue on the, the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And it was called the Encyclopedia of 9-11. And mm -hmm. it's a counterintuitive way to do that because encyclopedia is so cool and 9-11 is such a hot subject. Right. But it weirdly worked because it sort of broke it down in a hundred ways. And what you realized was that you came at this very complex, you know, enormously emotional subject through a hundred different angles when you did it that way. And it was mm -hmm. really, you know, I was, I was a very small piece of that issue, but it was one of the better magazines we've ever made. And this time around, we were talking about a book. We did, we did a book a couple of years ago that was devoted to the magazine's own history. And then we were following it up with another. And, and the word encyclopedia was sort of lingering in the air right. from that issue. And we kept talking it through and kept talking it through. And we realized, you know, as, as um, Whitney mentioned earlier, there exist reference book encyclopedias. And there are sort of playful visual encyclopedias, but there didn't seemed to be a book that kind of fell into the, the zone where we make the magazine um, right. with the particular cocktail of the serious and the silly and, uh, and the graphic design pop that we're known for. And so we said, well, let's try to make a book like that. And then I spent a year doing that. <laughs> and it, the results are amazing. I mean, it's just, it, I honestly, I don't know how you did it, frankly, mm -hmm. so well. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I, I find fascinating about it is how many of, um, how much New York has been changed by the people who have come to New York mm -hmm. and you go into their, their stories of how they come here. So, you know, it begs to ask, what's your New York story? How are my you? New York story, my New York story is probably, you know, it's fairly conventional, but I'll, I'll tell it in 90 seconds and then I want to hear yours at some point. Okay, 90 <laughs> seconds, I'm trying. But, you know, I, I was, I was, when I went away to college, I discovered that I liked city life. I lived in a, in a, in a, in a city row house for the first time because I was a suburban kid and I didn't understand walkability and you know, uh, the, the idea that you could just drop what you were doing and walk down to someplace and go see a concert. It was very new to me instead of having right. to get a ride. You know? And uh, from the time I was a student, I thought, I think I want to try New York. And if you're going to be a writer and an editor, that's what you do here. Um, and I came here and I, I, I took the smallest apartment you have ever seen. <laughs> and, I'm sure. And, and, uh, and I never left. I'm the terrible like Noah Baumbach movie character, uh, you know, um, joke of a New Yorker who never leaves the island. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Your turn. <laughs> um, Oh no! I have to. Add, I'm before. I'm before I even tell you oh, my yeah, New York yeah. story. Mm -hmm. um, I brought that up because of this. When I'm looking at the book, <laughs> and all, and it's beautiful, as we said. There's one thing that just really just popped out at me, and the, it's the story of Q-tips. <laughs> Please um, tell our audience about Q-tips. I'm so glad you singled this one out. <laughs> Who couldn't? Because you of know all the things you think well, of in New York, Q-tips is not one. So please, it's not one. It's true. It's true. It's true. Here's the thing that here's one of the things I do enjoy about having put this book together, and it's the it's the it's the juxtaposition of giant subjects and teeny ones, right? You know, <laughs> right? Um, you know, so you're going through like a P P, for example. You're turning the pages in P. The last entry is punk, big global music phenomenon. Turn the page, Q-tips. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the crazy story, just to fill, you, fill it in, is that in the 1920s, an inventor named Leo Gerstenzanger, if I remember that right, um, was, he, he saw his wife cleaning their baby's ear clumsily with a little piece of cotton, and he had the idea for a swab, and then he started marketing and selling, and you know, and it took off. The crazy detail I discovered was that um, the product was not called Q-tips to begin with. They were called baby gays. Baby gays is, of course, what leapt out at me too. <laughs> I Why? I guess. Why? Uh, the, the daughter was, her name was Elizabeth, but she was nicknamed gay because she had a gay disposition 
as as one said back then. <laughs> exactly. The word has uh, obviously changed. A little bit. And then the detail I love is that uh, when they change the name later on um, to Q-tips, you know, there was the, the company now says the Q is for quality or something like that. You know, amazing. But apparently, it was because Gay herself, Elizabeth, was a cutie. Oh, he was a cutie. <laughs> a cutie. Oh, cutie. Oh, Q-tips. I get it. Oh, I, ow. I so my I so would have loved to interview her, but I just missed my chance. She died, I think, in two thousand seventeen. Oh it's man. So old Palm Beach socialite living on a Q-tip fortune. <laughs> oh my, <laughs> epic fail that you couldn't talk to her, I gotta oh, say. Yeah. It would have been epic. delightful, yeah. And while we're talking about Q-tips, I just wanna remind our, our the people that are watching right now, never put anything in your ear except your elbow. Right. Um, thank By you. By the way, there's a tiny little box on that page where we interviewed uh, uh, an ear, nose and throat doctor and said, well, okay, so what do you do? <laughs> exactly, so you're even, see, it's a very informative book. It tells you what to do um, about we your ears. To educate. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I came to New York a little, I came to New York um, in 1997 and uh, it, it happened because uh, the Shakespeare in the Park, which is a major uh, New York tradition, uh, that year they had done the entire Shakespeare cycle and, and uh, it was also a huge New York anniversary. So they wanted to do something to celebrate the city of New York and they wanted to do a musical. Well, the answer is obvious on the town. That is a musical mm -hmm. that celebrates the city of New York and you know, it's all about it. And um, so they decided they were gonna do on the town. George C. Wolfe was directing the public theater as we all know produces Shakespeare in the Park. And uh, was, I'll make this as short as possible. They were having trouble casting the role of Hildy, the cab driver um, that everyone is familiar with the movie knows that part. Um, they were having trouble casting her. Um, they, weren't, they weren't finding the right fit is basically it. And uh, George Wolfe, after it went, they went, it went on forever. They looked at all the leading ladies of New York, all of them in LA. He went to London. He actually started looking at men, the concept of men wearing in drag playing the role. Um, and then realized he was talking to his staff. If, you know, what makes Hildy, what makes Hildy funny? That's my New York, that, that's my George. <laughs> he sounds exactly like that. What makes Hildy funny? She's a woman that acts like a man. We need a lesbian. That's what he said. And, uh, at that time in 1997, if somebody said we need a lesbian, I was the only one there. It was this was before all the all the other girls came out. Sure. So uh, when he said that, the casting director went, "You know what? I got a lesbian for you." And they called me in, and I got the and I got the part. Mm -hmm. And when it moved to Broadway, I made them give me an apartment here. Get, like mm -hmm. they had to get me an apartment because I knew it was easier to go lead a Broadway musical than it was to find an apartment in New York City. Mm -hmm. So that is. <laughs> That's my New York, and I never left because uh, yeah. I was in LA at the time. But I'm not, I'm not an LA person. New York, I'm, I, you know, New York is me. I am a New Yorker. So that's it. Which leads me to, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the biggest reasons people love New York, which is obviously going to be in this book, is the musical theater section. For sure. Um, yeah. There are multiple entries devoted to theater, but really there's a long entry written about the musical, which I cannot take credit for. It's by our theater critic, Helen Shaw, who is a wonderful writer and has seen everything ever, ever. And she's uh, a great critic. She is, she really is. I agree with her almost every time. So that's she, I'm like, she's, she's great. <laughs> she's easy to like on the page. She she comes in with the right spirit. You know, she's a, she's a, she's a critic who wants to like things instead of a critic who wants to hate things. Yes. Uh, and that's an important thing. And she, but at the same time, she has judgment. It's, anyway, I could, I could do an hour on how good Helen is. <laughs> yeah. We'll save it for another program. Anyway, she wrote this entry. And one thing I loved is that she has a section in it about the very first Broadway musical, um, which was called The Black Crook. There was a little production of it a couple of years ago. And the, the amazing story is that it was, it was kind of made up by accident. Um, there was a ballet company that was supposed to come to New York and play the Academy of Music, and the, which was a big old uh, performance space back then. And the Academy of Music burned down just before they arrived. So they said, well, what are we gonna do? And there was this other theater nearby that had a play going. And they said, what if we put some dancing into the play? <laughs> 
So it was this sort of unholy cocktail of cobbled together. And I mean, you worked in commercial theater. You know, these things happen. Oh, yes, right? very well. <laughs> and the great detail at the end is that the, the site on which all this ended up playing out was a couple of blocks from the public theater. <laughs> Amazing. So we're Amazing. still living, we're still living in that world, you know? Um, Amazing. Yeah, and then it goes through the golden age of theater. You can see the picture come up in the, the uh, pages that we have scrolling past people in the chat. There's a, just this great picture of Peter Rivera and West Side Story that I could look at all day long. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, well, that I actually learned something because I always thought historically that Porgy and Bass was considered the first musical in New York. So to know this about that was, mm -hmm. I mean, that was like, that blew me away. That just yeah, blew me away. Arguing over the first musical is one of those things theater people do. Um, yeah. A lot of people put their money on Showboat, which is yeah, the, that's you know, and, and a lot of a lot of people do Porgy and Bess. It's just it's that's right. It's uh, it's kind of interesting. It's all interesting. It's of, you know what I mean? One of those things you do on your third cocktail at uh, at uh, Joe, Joe Allen's. <laughs> we said the same name. <laughs> oh my God! You owe me a Coke. <laughs> So, I mean, it, it just, you just go through so many things that are so indicative, you know, with New York. I mean, obviously there are things that are a little less like I'm fascinated by. I live in, I live in Brooklyn, I live in Bushwick. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my biggest pet peeves is that the people in my neighborhood do not clean up after their dog. <laughs> I think I know what so, you're doing. <laughs> so when you're talking to me and say you're doing big topics and small topics, you literally have a section that is dedicated to the pooper scooper laws in New York. <laughs> One of the finest inventions of the of its time. Oh my god. Absolutely. And it's such a crazy story. It's such a crazy story. Because you think it's a fairly sensible thing, an act of law that people have to clean up after their dogs, right? You get yeah. five minutes of debate. People went bananas over this because they, they either they didn't want to do it or they were outraged at being required to do it or they felt it was undignified. And let's face it, if you watch a guy walking around with a bag of poop on a hand, you know, they may have a point. It is completely I, I, undignified. I, I always say, you know, you watch a guy in a suit with a with a bag of poop and the dog, right? And you have to ask who is the pet and who is the owner in this situation? <laughs> because who's in charge here really, you know? <laughs> anyway, so uh, it, was, it was enacted in the late seventies and the hearings, people went crazy. There were, there were like, there were actual bags of poop thrown at the legislators That's in protest. So <laughs> I found a detail in, in one of the press reports from that time. I found the best detail. It was somebody criticizing the, um, the guy on the, on the uh, I forget whether he was from the Department of Sanitation or on the city council or whatever, but the guy really pushing for the law. And they had discovered that he didn't have dogs. He had turtles. <laughs> oh my. This was a fun really, project to put together. You really have to clean up after your turtle when you have it. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, the research just must have, you must have gone crazy with the research. I mean, you must have just been entertained completely. I, I'm, a mad, I'm a madman researcher anyway. I love nothing better than a deep archive dive. And I went down the deepest rabbit holes imaginable. I mean, you know, you, you spend a day and a half reading about the Pooper Scooper Law, reading every clip in the New York Times that ever brings it up. It does something to a man, but I think that's, <laughs> I think it was mostly to the good. <laughs> Well, I'm a, I'm a huge I'm a huge friend of the Jews, by the way. I'm I'm not Jewish. I'm I'm Italian. I'm well Sicilian, which basically I always refer to as said that uh, we're just phlegmless Jews. We're the same as Jews. We just don't go. <laughs> Everything else is the same. And uh, you have the Yiddish Rialto, a really great story about the Yiddish Rialto um, in here, which I again didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I would love, I'm sure people will be interested in this. So please. It's, it's an almost lost world. And it was fun to write about in that sense for just to fill people in from about mm, call it 1890 up until the middle of the 20th century. There was an enormous 
um, Yiddish language theater scene in New York. Um, and at its peak, it was not quite as big as Broadway theater, but it was really big. There were houses on the Lower East Side that sat almost 2,000 people. You know, they were the size of the Schubert. And the productions were entirely in Yiddish, uh, almost always. They were usually written that way, although there were other, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, like uh, there were translations of Shakespeare, for example, in Yiddish. And it was Amazing. To feed, it was to feed the enormous, obviously, the enormous Jewish immigrant community that had come over. So a lot of the plays were domestic dramas. You know, there were often stories about like, you know, conflict between people from the old country and their Americanized kids, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Right. right. Uh, but these theaters lined Second Avenue in particular, down on the Lower East Side from, from below house and up to like 14th Street, something like that. Um, and that got known as the Yiddish Rialto. Uh, a couple of them, the buildings still exist. There's a movie theater at 2nd and 12th where if you walk past it, first of all, it has a lot of the sort of, um, you know, uh, Moorish revival details that you see in synagogues, you know. Mm -hmm. But also if you walk past the, the, um, the uh, uh, stone in the corner, the, 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 the um, cornerstone with the dates, they're written in English and in Hebrew characters. I have never noticed that. Yeah, next time I've you go. Never noticed that. I've, been, I've been there a million times, never seen that. Now that makes me want to hop in an Uber right now and go take a look at it. Yeah, well, that, that's a thing about studying the history of New York. You very quickly realize that a lot of it lingers around you in small bits and pieces and you live with it every day, you know? Um, right. And it comes up in this book often that these things you know, like the Yiddish Rialto is almost gone, but the buildings are still there. And there are other details too. Like one of the biggest stars in the Yiddish theater was Fiber Schwinkel, who you may remember was on TV in the nineties on Picket Fences. Oh my gosh. Of course I do. That's crazy. But it, it makes complete sense. He was a young dude in the theater in 1930. And he was a funny old man in 1990. <laughs> I love it. Uh -huh. I, I absolutely love it. I mean, this is, it's just a treasure trove of stuff. There are certain topics that people talk about all the time in New York. You know what I mean? Um, we, and you, you have them like immigration, for example, it's just something that, uh, that, that we see all the time. And uh, of course the gay rights movement, uh, uh -huh. which is, this is the birthplace of the gay rights movement. So uh -huh. rightfully so you spend a lot of time with that. It's near and dear uh -huh. to my heart. Absolutely. But other things that I don't, that you that is so New York that we don't really talk about. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, one of my favorite little things is the loft living. Yeah, that's we are know, a loft living community, and uh, there aren't that there aren't that out. That's not out there. You don't see it that often. You really see it in New York. It's really true, and it's you know it's so sort of universally accepted that when you see a. a, a an artsy character in a movie that they live in a former industrial space with a high ceiling and big arch windows and pipes, right? Right. That, that wasn't always true. And it's a crazy quirk of the economics of New York that made it that way. You know, mm -hmm. what happened just to run down the history, I mean, it's familiar to a lot of people, but it's still interesting. Please go for it, go for it. In the late sixties, New York lost a lot of manufacturing. It went to the South, it went to the West, eventually it went to overseas. And this, all those buildings in Soho were factories. They made paper boxes and underwear and uh, uh, small machine parts. You know, they were all light industry. They had great big windows because they were built in the 19th century when you didn't have really good electric lighting. So they had light pouring in, right? They mm -hmm. were factory buildings. And then suddenly in the 60s, they were deserted and nobody was paying taxes on them. Nobody was doing anything with them. And a lot of artists around 1967, eight, nine, abruptly realized that making sculptures or giant paintings or uh, pouring metal to cast mm -hmm. is a lot like factory work. And an old factory building is a pretty good place to do it. And that they could get us a, a floor for 50 bucks a month. Amazing. And as we all know, the key to making art is partly a big cheap space in which to do it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so these abandoned blocks became an artist community. And then they started showing up in magazines like the one I work for and uh, in movies and in photo shoots. And people were like, hey, that looks kind of nice as a way of living. There's so much light in the, coming through those big arched windows, right? And right. suddenly these places nobody wanted became desirable. And flash forward 45, 50 years, and they are the most expensive rooms in New York of City. 
Be, of course. Because nobody jump, wanted them. <laughs> yeah. I want to jump in a time machine and, and go back to 1960. Don't get we all? all. <laughs> um, I, the, uh, Absolutely. The interview, yeah. It's, it's, so, it's so satisfying to talk to old loft people because they just said, oh, we were carving out this light. You know, we had no heat. Uh, Chuck Close, the artist, moved to a loft in Soho in 1967, and he hired a friend to do his plumbing, and it was Philip Glass. <laughs> just, that's amazing. <laughs> I asked that's him amazing. about it. I asked him about it, and he said he's a better composer than he is a plumber. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> I still like the idea of Philip Glass like doing my toilet. Just <laughs> makes me. Up there with his little torch. <laughs> please, please. Phil Glass would, would put a toilet flush in a song. So he would flush it over and over and over. Oh, sugar, sugar, exactly. sugar, 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 That's sugar. That's my, my Phil Glass Christmas song on the first day up, on the first day up, on the first day up. But I, you know, you know the old you know the old joke that he's he's actually named Philip Glass Glass, Philip Philip Glass, Philip Glass Glass, <laughs> Philip Philip Glass. Glass. No, no, that and I wish I had written it, it's so good. <laughs> it's mean, but it's good. <laughs> I love it, I love it. So I would be remiss if we didn't talk about a section in here that is pretty current. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's called Trumpism. Uh huh. <laughs> and I feel like it's, you know, the, the Thursday before the election. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm uh, going to not I'll bring my political views about any of it into what? this. Why don't we both exercise some restraint? But here's the thing I'll say about that. Um, the book does not have entries for individual people mm -hmm. because we felt like it was a book about inventions, things that New York gave to the world. So for example, there's no entry for Robert Moses, who is the you know, most influential, monstrous, you know, far ranging figure in, in the 20th century, probably in New York City. Right. Um, but there was an entry for the elevated highway, which he invented. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is an entry for Trumpism, and we we talked a little about how to approach it. But our feeling was that he did make something, and that something is a is you know the ability to work media, especially, mm -hmm. and and the hype machine, and public mm -hmm. relations, and doing a little bit, and saying you did a lot, and just telling people you're the biggest and the best. And what he taught us all is that if you do that, it might work, <laughs> right? I mean, you know. Um, well, yeah, yeah. And, you know, falsehood spreads easier than the truth always. Okay. So yeah. I will, I will also say that there is another entry in this book um, uh, covering P.T. Barnum and it's oh. called Freak Show. And you should perhaps read them side by side. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god chris i just love you i just adore you right now that made me so happy yeah maybe we should so um we are reaching a moment here where we should probably uh, want to talk about uh, throwing some questions out to the audience okay uh yes i i have the q a window so i'll i'll uh let's see I can look at a few good ones. Okay, so we had somebody asked if we decided on all the entries or did we have a team at New York Magazine debate on what could be concluded? Oh my gosh, we had spreadsheets and lists and meetings and we, that we cast the widest possible net to get people um, to nominate things. And then a lot of what I did was fact checking because a lot of things that you think came from New York turn out not to. And we had a lot like? of- uh, let's see, what got chucked out at the last minute? Oh, of course, Bagels. No, not, I can't remember. We did end up putting in the bagel, even though it's not, it wasn't invented here. We decided that it was so thoroughly a New York, a thing that New York broadcast to the world that we could get away with it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I love it. And, were there uh, fights over it? Did you fight? Um, there were uh, not, not so much fights. There, there were a couple of arguments over whether something should be in. Yeah, there's an entry. I won't mention it, but... I, I, I wanted it in and people were just bothered by it. And it was, uh, it was uh, you know, I cut it reluctantly at the last minute. And oh, I then, really want to know what that was. And I'll tell you off camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it was obnoxious. <laughs> and then there were last minute discoveries. I love the last minute discoveries. There was, there was um, what was it? There was at the very end of the process, I discovered really like, you know, a few weeks before the book went off to press, I discovered of all things dry cleaning, 
it was invented in New York. I noticed the dry cleaning thing and I was actually gonna say something. So please go for that. It's the weirdest little fact. And it turns out to be a fascinating story because the person who invented dry cleaning was an, a free African-American man in the 1820s in New York. And it, his name's Thomas Jennings. And it is apparently the first, the records are a little sketchy, but apparently the first US patent granted to a black person. Um, Amazing. And you know, and it's actually that's actually a pretty big invention, right? He got rich yeah. I'm pleased to report. Yes, his his wife had been born. He was a free man, but his wife had been born in slavery. He made enough money off his dry cleaning business to to buy her freedom. Amazing. Yeah, crazy. That's right? that's a really amazing story. It's a story that should be out there more. I was one one thing that's nice when you do like a, a book like this is that you can find little little narratives that ought to be told more often and aren't, and you know. I was very pleased to tell. Well, that narrative autumn that. that should be made into a movie. Um, <laughs> Frankly, he, he's a good That's story. A great yeah. story. His yeah. daughter became a big abolitionist in the 1840s. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, there are. Uh, there's another question uh, Susan Glazer has for us, asking about why the pooper scooper law was so successful. <laughs> 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 you got me. I mean, I think. I think it's probably the reason you think it is. <laughs> it's not successful in my neighborhood, just saying. Okay. Well, I, the, my understanding, the conventional view is that it, it succeeded because it, it, what it did was add a public stigma. It, it shamed people into complying because if you, if you didn't clean up after your dog, people would give you a dirty look and chase after you. You, know, you have to figure that New Yorkers were willing to, how shall we say, uh, defend their turf. Yeah, and they still are. I mean, New Yorkers let almost anything ride and not, you know what I mean? And what, right. not even give it a second glance. Right. But if you but see somebody that. walk away from their dog poop, every New Yorker says something. Yes, exactly. That's, that's my guess. Anyway, the public shaming aspect, it worked. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Any, any more good questions? Which archives or libraries did you visit? Well, I'll tell you. I did do some work at the New York Public Library, but the bulk of this book was finished in quarantine. <laughs> so uh, there were a lot of digital research questions that got uh, checked by phone rather than at the library or by, you know, from books. Uh, there are a couple of um, books that were trapped in my office that I needed and I had to buy fresh copies. Yeah. Yeah, totally ouch. Well, I would imagine that quarantining would have just changed the just how one researches completely. It's really you know? it's Yeah, really you true. seem like a really a hands-on kind of guy. I, I imagine you going into the stacks of um, you know, New York magazine and looking at the actual magazines and you know, all of that. So yes. this must have been a tiny bit of a burden on you. You got me pegged. It's true. And I um, you know, uh, I uh, was able to draw on it was helpful that I was not the only person working on this. As I said, we had a big team at the magazine of people researching and doing their bit. Um, and so, you know, there could be a kind of a call put out, like, does anybody have this source or that book or an ac access to this archive or whatever? So that helped somewhere. And then, you know, I, I, I've been the city editor for a long time. So I have a lot of books about New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm that gonna... also helps. You, you, I think every New Yorker fights about what makes you a New Yorker or how long you have to be here. And, you know, I've, I've been here for well over 20 years now, so I consider myself a full-on New Yorker. Mm -hmm. So, you mm -hmm. know, I've seen a lot in the last 20 years. But most of the stuff that you're talking about is hundreds of years old and, mm -hmm. uh, and incredibly fascinating. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, let's just do, let's do one. Um, let's talk, if you don't mind, because it's near and dear to my heart, let's talk a little bit about the gay rights movement because I really like what, the way it's portrayed in this encyclopedia. Uh, it's gratifying to hear that. You know, that, that entry, I'll, I'll credit the writer again. That's, it's by a woman named Claire Potter, who's a wonderful writer. She's a professor at the New School and she does a lot of queer studies research mm -hmm. and teaching. Um, and she, the thing I like about it best, I'd be curious to hear what, what you responded to in this, but the real thing that I liked was that, uh, first of all, a certain number of histories of the gay rights movement focus mostly on the men, and this goes back and forth. And secondarily, um, it doesn't adhere to the sort of conventional thing started at Stonewall and then progressed through the 1970s uh -huh. and then the AIDS, you know, the, 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 the AIDS crisis and the, and the backlash, not backlash, the, uh, the, the, the fighting against the AIDS crisis. That's, that's sort of a conventional narrative and it's fine, it's not bad, 
But the fact is, it goes way further back. It goes back to the Mattachine Society. The Mattachine Society. The daughters. It talks about the daughters of Bilitis. It is yes. every the, you ask me what my why I liked it. That's exactly why. There's mm -hmm. a history that's that's far beyond just the Stonewall riots. We we know why we say that that is the start of this movement, but they, those people were also standing on the shoulders of giants and it's all out in this book. And thank God she talked about the lesbians. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's something that uh, I, the, even in the last, the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, I felt that we were uh, not very well represented. Mm -hmm. And I that's the major reason I like what you've done with this book. So. Yeah. It was, yes, I told you. <laughs> it was something I was conscious of uh, when uh, I was assigning it, but I didn't, it ended up, I didn't have to worry about it because she wrote the piece you wanted. <laughs> yeah, no, I think she wrote the piece that everybody wanted. I, and I really suggest everyone get it for, uh, for that alone. You know what I mean? We got any more questions there? Do we have any more? Uh, there is one more. What was the time frame of the writing? Uh, it was roughly a year. And it, uh, it peaked this spring. I, the thing is lots of people worked on it and they overlapped, you know, but it was right. a piece of my job last year. And this spring, it was my, my all consuming job. Right, um, right. And, uh, and then there was a lot of last minute work too because we, um, we had some changes slipping in as the city locked down because it is a history of New York. And to tell it without that particular history of New York felt inadequate. That seems exactly, exactly right. So I've got to just bring you to this. I have to ask you what, what is your favorite? Do you have like a favorite or, you know, I have two or three. I do. Oh, great. D tell me because um, it's, there, there's an entry for stickball that I'm very warm on because it's sort of cuddly old Brooklyn. Um, there's an entry for frozen custard, which talks <laughs> about the frozen custard stands of Coney Island in, in uh, the mid 20th century. And I, that one is particularly close to my heart because my grandparents owned one. No. There's a line in there about the Greek immigrants that owned the frozen custard stands. And I can tell you that one of them is Argyris P. Bonanos of Mermaid oh, Avenue my, on the I, island. <laughs> yes, that's it's, amazing. It's an Easter egg in the book. Um, so I'm very fond of that. And then there's one that it was so obnoxious that we had to put it in, which is that New York City claim, we, we claim the invention of Vermont, the state. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what? So Vermont during the colonial era was a, attached to New York State. It was not an independent entity. And because New York City was the capital, it had dominion over Vermont at the time. And there was a battle because New Hampshire also claimed the territory that is now Vermont. Oh my God. And it went, it, it was, they fought over it and it went, it went to the boss who at the time was the king. <laughs> right. King George. And he said, no, New York gets it. So New York had it. And then after the revolution, it broke off and, and became, it's for, for a few years, its own country the Republic of Vermont, and then joined the <laughs> Union. So, uh, <laughs> that could happen again, just saying. <laughs> we invented a state, which is just, is it not the most obnoxious New Yorker thing to claim I to have it. invented an entire state? <laughs> You're all the one, that's fantastic. We, we did invent it. We invented sure, Vermont. I know. Right. I'm and then, oh, there's, there's one other one I'll mention, which is I love that we invented Jell-O. <laughs> Jell-O was invented in New York? Yellow was invented by Peter Cooper. Uh -huh. Cooper Union, Peter Cooper Village, the Cooper Hewitt, right. that, that Cooper. He, he made his money in railroads, but he also had a huge uh, uh, a glue business. He made glue in a glue factory. And that meant he made gelatin from the bone. Of course he did. And there's a patent he filed. I, I forget the exact year, it's about 1850, but he filed a patent in which it's for, it's for Cooper's Isinglass gelatin or something like that. And in it, there's a few lines. It says, you know, you could add fruit flavoring and sugar and make a very nice molded dessert. And you might, uh, you might flavor it uh, with peach or lemon or, or <laughs> strawberries. And then he has one other line that kills me. He says, you could also add eggs to enrich it. In other words, Peter Cooper not only invented jello, but possibly also flan. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. 
That All is right. fantastic. Well, this is, it's been a, a real pleasure. I've got to say, do we have any more questions that maybe it, one last question I, before we close out? Uh, there is, uh, somebody asked, is there an entry on hip hop? And I will tell you absolutely the longest entry in the book is about hip hop. It is by our pop critic, Craig Jenkins. And uh, it's, a, it's a freaking masterpiece. <laughs> Fantastic. I actually didn't see, I didn't see that. I'm actually gonna go look at that right as soon as we get um, off. I, you know, because I mean we, we try to do big entries for big things and small entries for small things. You know, Q tips is that big. Um, right. Hip hop is several pages because it's a you know trillion dollar global phenomenon. I mean it, it actually did like make a big dent in the world. So we wanted Absolutely. to give well, Chris, it's just an amazing book, and I really do encourage everyone to get it. And uh, it's just going to be, uh, it seriously will be the best Christmas present for anybody out there that you know that loves this city. And it's, like, it's you've just done a tremendous job. Everyone, everyone has. I'm, I, I'm delighted that you liked it, and I'm flattered, and uh, and I'm so glad you did this too. I'm a longtime fan of yours. It's really oh, good. Oh, thank you. No, thank you for having me. And of course, yes. I'm a fan. I'm a total fan of this book. And I'm a fan of the Museum of New York. I'm a fan of the New Yorker. I'm sorry, of New York Magazine. Don't kill me. And you uh, saw, so I, I mean, you even write about comedy clubs in here. Come on. Oh, I'm, I know. I, we didn't even get to that, but that's, that's so much. And jazz, all of it's in here. So it's like, it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's a really great read, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, thanks for having us. Sure. So I, I just want to jump in. Oh my God, this was such an amazing, lively conversation and captured so many rich New York stories. I think um, from the history of New York, um, there are lots of things I'm going to be thinking about, the financial freedoms that come from dry cleaning, gay history, um, and also Phil class's side job. I mean, these are amazing <laughs> stories. Um, and you know, this is what we do um, in our daily life at the Museum of City of New York. So thank you for sharing your enthusiasm and such a rich discussion. And for those of you who are online right now, we hope to see you come back for many of our upcoming programs or in person at the museum because we are open Thursday through Monday. So thank you all. Good night. Good night. Bye.